You're listening to the FQXI podcast. Today. It's more than just a curiosity, by the way. The idea of the universal constructor is basically ancient. It's, it's like began with the idea in antiquity of a cornucopia, which was a thing that produced an endless supply of whatever food you would like, delicious food. Could we build a machine that can perform any task? The laws of physics are such that there is a single machine that can mimic the computational power of any other machine to arbitrary accuracy. And all that you have to give it is fast hardware and memory. David Deutsch on the implications of the universal constructor. So that any truth about the physics or engineering of the Eiffel Tower can be expressed in terms that do not refer to the Eiffel Tower. But that might be false, and if it's false, then it would definitely mean that there's no uh, universal constructor. I'm Zia Morali. Welcome to the podcast from the Foundational Questions Institute. This is our first edition of 2024. A bit late, yes, but then we've all got so much to do. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a machine that could perform any task or build anything for us? A single device, a universal constructor, we might say. Today we have a special interview with David Deutsch of Oxford University, one of the pioneers of quantum information theory, which laid the groundwork for quantum computation. In his conversation with reporter Logan Chipkin, Deutsch chats a little bit about that history in the context of his new work on whether a universal constructor can be built. Deutsch is not just musing. The idea of a universal constructor was spawned by a unifying framework of physics that he developed with Chiara Marletto called constructor theory, one we've talked about a few times before with Marletto and others on this podcast. Traditional physics often considers how a system evolves from some initial state of particles over time based on some physical laws. Constructor theory, inspired by thermodynamics, the science of heat and energy transfer, takes a different approach, considering which transformations are allowed in the forwards direction in time and which are allowed backwards and which are impossible. The theory defines constructors to be objects that can perform these transformations without themselves being changed. It all sounds very abstract, but a constructor can be something as simple as a kettle that boils water, performing a transformation without itself changing. I will say that if you haven't already, it is worth going and listening to Logan's previous interviews, including with Oxford's Chiara Marletto, as I've mentioned, a co-founder of Constructor Theory, and Vlatko Vedral about their work on the framework, including thinking about implications for life. I'm putting a link on the podcast page, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, and you'll also find the link in the YouTube blurb if you are listening on YouTube. If you do want to listen to that, then after you've done so, be sure to come back here. You'll find that earlier interview provides an introduction that really enriches this conversation. But if you want to skip on ahead and just dive straight in with David Deutsch, Then you'll want to know that constructor theory has already had success in unifying aspects of thermodynamics and information theory. In today's chat with Logan, Deutsch concentrates on the concept of a universal constructor, a machine that can perform any task, and whether or not it can be built. What would it mean for fundamental physics and the nature of reality if such a device exists? What might it be like, and what effects would it have on the economy? Could a person be thought of as a universal constructor? Deutsch also laments the difficulty of finding funding to support work on such paradigm-shifting advances. But to begin, Logan takes Deutsch back to his older work on the idea of a universal quantum computer and how that may be related to the universal constructor. All right, I'm here with David Deutsch. David, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, indeed. So I want to talk about the universal constructor, which is a theoretical machine that can cause any physical transformation that can possibly be caused. 
Now, why is understanding the universal constructor important to understanding the nature of reality rather than it being merely an engineering curiosity? Yes. It's more than just a curiosity, by the way. The idea of the universal constructor is basically ancient. It's, it's like began with the idea in antiquity of a cornucopia, which is a thing that produced an endless supply of whatever food you would like, delicious food. But then pretty soon people began to think about a machine that could produce anything you like. And this uh, has been explored in science fiction and so on. So I don't think it's just a curiosity engineering wise. It would be a dramatic and important innovation. But you ask about what is its connection with fundamental physics. It is basically a generalization of the idea of universal computation. And universal computation, as conceived of by Babbage and Lovelace and then by Turing, is really the only way to understand what computation actually is. A non-universal theory of computation wouldn't be a theory of computation at all. That, that would be just a theory of engineering. So the theory of, of universal computation which I then sort of brought into the quantum era by developing the theory of the universal quantum computer, is the assertion that such a thing can exist is an assertion about the laws of physics. The laws of physics are such that there is a single machine that can mimic the computational power of any other machine to arbitrary accuracy. And all that you have to give it is fast hardware and memory. Now, the universal constructor comes in here because that universality is not the only one that could exist. And in fact, I think it is, is not the only one that does exist. There's also the question of not just performing any computation, but performing any transformation of physical objects. And not if given enough memory and so on, but if given only knowledge. Because if there's something you have to give it other than knowledge, which it itself couldn't provide, then it's not universal. So it has a similar but different logic from a universal computer and its relationship with physics is a generalization of that of the universal computer. Now, you wrote in the foundational paper on constructor theory that the possible existence of a universal constructor might be proved from independently motivated constructor theoretic principles. It appears to be. So it, it could be that, that if there is no machine that can be given just knowledge to then perform any, transform any given transformation, then, well, you know, I, <laughs> I, I can't quite imagine exactly what it would imply, but if there is something that, can't, that you can't program a machine to build, then that really means that there is something that can't be built. And if there's something that can exist but can't be built, then that means that there's a, well, it might mean that there's a resource in nature that is finite and not replenishable. Not just a resource like uh, negative entropy, but uh, a resource like, let's say, a monopole, a magnetic monopole. We think there aren't any, but suppose that we're wrong about that, and suppose that there is exactly one magnetic monopole. Then that would mean that any machine that included a magnetic monopole in its design essentially, so that it couldn't perform its function without the magnetic monopole, then that would mean that that particular machine could perform a task that no other machine can perform. And, you know, if the magnetic monopole falls out and rolls across the floor and you can't find it, then the, the task can't be performed at all. And if you can find it, it can only, only be performed once by that machine and there'll be a maximum speed at which it can go and, and so on. So that's the kind of thing it would say. It would, it would be a sort of 
de-universalization of our fundamental understanding of the universe. We tend to think, when thinking about more and more fundamental things, that the laws about fundamental things are going to not refer to specific objects. Like, there isn't just a law that applies to the Eiffel Tower. There are laws that apply to iron structures and to structures built in gravity and, and uh, so on. So that any truth about the physics or engineering of the Eiffel Tower can be expressed in terms that do not refer to the Eiffel Tower. But that might be false. And if it's false, then it would definitely mean that there's no uh, universal constructor. So if a universal constructor is possible to build, then presumably people are entities that can build them with the requisite knowledge, as you were kind of alluding to. So then why would a person not be considered a universal constructor? Since every transformation that a universal constructor can cause, a person plus a universal constructor could also cause. Yes, indeed. Well, the answer is imperfection. So a constructor is actually a limiting case, an unphysical limiting case of real physical objects. So there is no such thing as a literally a constructor for converting hydrogen and oxygen into water, for example. You can perform that with 99% accuracy or 99.9% accuracy, but not with 100% accuracy and 100% reliability. There's always a, a probability that some of it will escape and so on. And for any given machine that can convert hydrogen and oxygen into water imperfectly. There's another machine that one could build that would build it less imperfectly, but there is no machine that could build it with absolute perfection. Now, you can regard a human being as a highly imperfect universal constructor in that, given enough knowledge, a person could build a universal constructor that's better than itself. And in fact, that's the secret to the, to the proof and to the theory of the universal constructor as I see it. But the thing is, suppose you need more memory than the brain has, has capacity for. Then, unlike with a computer, it's not a trivial thing, just, oh, well, we'll give it more memory. With the universal constructor, you'll have to say, oh, well, we'll have to tell it how to make that memory. And so we would have to give them the program, be given the program for making enough memory to do the task of a universal constructor and so on. And then once we're given all that massive amount of information to do all that, there might not be time in a human lifetime to do that. So therefore, we'd have to be given a program that would extend the human lifetime and, and so on. So you see that the, the degree to which a human is a universal constructor, well, it's, it's rather a, a Pickwickian sense because it's so highly impractical and would require so much knowledge that we do not currently have. That, and if we did have it, we could do the universal constructor thing much more easily. That it's, for most purposes, not useful to consider humans as a universal constructor or a human at any rate. It, it could be that humans as, as a whole are. There's also the fact that neither a human nor the set of all humans is obedient. A universal constructor has to be perfectly obedient and uh, people and collections of people are disobedient. And in fact, disobedience is necessary for their more important functionality of explanatory universality. Have you given any thought to what the economic implications might be if and when humans commodify the universal constructor? Uh, this has been uh, studied by, by many people before. Uh, I think people have had somewhat the wrong idea of what a universal constructor will look like, but it, it, it doesn't make any difference for thinking about economic issues. I think one thing that many people may have got wrong is that the universal constructor won't be as sudden 
a change, a, like a singularity. It, it won't be a singularity because although it is true that a universal constructor can be programmed to build two more and each one of those can be programmed to build two more and so on. First of all, this will at first be done rather inefficiently, just as you know, the very first one will have to be built by humans and the uh, inefficiently and so on. And secondly, the issue of ownership and value of raw, raw materials does not go away once the issue of human effort goes away. The human effort will go away apart from the effort of programming universal constructors, but that, that's non-trivial. So people will be writing programs in effect. I mean, that, that doesn't mean that they'll be doing the same sort of thing as programmers do today. It's, it's more like they'll be doing the same sort of thing that scientists and engineers do today, mostly. They make designs in a computer. But then there will still be the issues if you want to convert I always give this example, if you want to convert Phobos and Deimos into busts of Napoleon, you'll run into the problem that someone else wants to convert them into busts of somebody else. And uh, this issue, we know how to resolve issues like that. It's, it's with ownership and private property and capitalism and also a regulatory framework that's based on the rule of law and that kind of thing. So we know how to do that. But it does mean that you can't just design a thing and have it built. It will still cost something. And how do you make money in a society with universal constructors? Well, you make money the same way that engineers do today, by programming computers. Now, how might a better understanding of what is required to create a universal constructor improve our understanding of the physics of thermodynamics and information. And I ask because I know that Chiara Marletto and Vladko Vedral and others have been doing some work with respect to how constructor theory can resolve some issues in both thermodynamics and information. And I know you've done work with respect to the constructor theory of information as well. Yes. Well, I think constructor theory can definitely help to provide deeper foundations to thermodynamics. Whether the universal constructor will is doubtful, but what one can't really tell until one has that theory. And I'm afraid the devil is in the detail here. Whether, I mean, you know, thermodynamics is important even when you build a steam engine. And thermodynamics is important if you build a wide variety of machines. And when they are built with universal constructors or with machines that are made by machines that are made by machines that are made by universal constructors, it will still be true that thermodynamics plays a role, but whether the foundations of the theory of universal constructors will have a role, I don't know. You also wrote in your foundational paper of constructor theory that there must be a smallest universal constructor. Do you think it's going to be interesting with respect to our understanding of nature and physics, the exact size of the smallest universal constructor, or do you think that's just going to be an incidental detail? My present view is, which has changed somewhat from when I wrote that paper, my present view is, is that it'll, it'll be more of an incidental detail. I mean, it might, be, it might be cool, it might be an interesting curiosity, rather like uh, asking what's the simplest possible Turing machine. It's a curiosity, but it doesn't help us with advancing either the theory of computation or the engineering of computers. It might do one day. I mean, it might come up and be relevant, but it doesn't look as though it will be. And I think the same is true of a universal constructor. I think the reason I had a bit of a misconception about that is that I hadn't realized at that time how much of a bottleneck generating the knowledge to program a universal constructor will be. So say you, we find out one day that the smallest universal constructor is made of uh, 37 atoms and that you provide those with the bootstrap program, which takes on board other atoms from the environment, um, you know, from empty space or, or from the ocean or, or something generic. And it makes a bigger constructor, which makes a bigger and more powerful constructor and eventually gets um, 
to a usable uh, universal constructor. Well, the thing is that your program for doing that will always begin with that same preamble. It'll always begin with what this 37 atom thing must do to make a bigger thing, make a bigger thing, and so on. And the important thing about the guts of the program will be what happens after that. So you may as well start with that universal constructor and have your other ones make that rather than make the, make the smallest one. Now, David, I want to pivot to a more sociological topic. How has the research environment changed since you began your career? And what might be done to resolve any issues that have emerged since you started working? Yes. Well, everybody has a unique path through life and through uh, science and through the funding system and so on. And uh, I'm probably one of the worst people to ask this question because I decided quite some time ago to leave the usual path. And fortunately, um, since I'm a theorist, I don't have to equip my own laboratory or anything like that. So it's relatively easy for me to uh, work at home and to just use the facilities of university uh, and pick and choose and not be paid and uh, that kind of thing. So I can only tell you anecdotally what it seems to me. It seems to me that the funding system and the career structure for fundamental science has been in rather drastic decline during my lifetime. Not that it was great when I was a graduate student, but there were certain things that that I have noticed. For example, when I was a graduate student, I got an interview, I, I was accepted, I came to a research group, and on day one, I was doing research. And it was research that I had discussed with my supervisor, and I did that research. And from time to time, my supervisor suggested that I go to a course and which he thought would be relevant to my research. And I never did. And that that was my experience of courses. Now, that's pretty much impossible. First of all, graduate students are compelled to go to courses. And secondly, the courses aren't chosen by their supervisor because the supervisor thinks it would be helpful. They're chosen by the department because they think it fulfills some criterion that they have to meet to their bosses or or whatever. Then a bit later, when one is a postdoc, one applies for research grants. When I applied for a research grant, I had to fill in a form that was extremely short compared to today's. I mean, it it took maybe, uh, I can't remember, but maybe half an hour, half half a day, sorry, to, to complete. And then I had to write an essay, basically, about what I was going to do and why this was interesting. That's what the essay was about. I did not have to write additional essays about what the impact of this will be on the field and what the impact of this will be on the economy of the country and lots of impact things. And then not to mention lots of things that are not relevant at all, like, for example, outreach. So the net effect of that is that the postdoc type people that I know have to spend literally many weeks filling out the equivalent of that form. And then, okay, the next thing that I see, again, maybe I've seen only an unrepresentative subset of what is happening, and it's all much better than I think it is. But nobody has ever said to me that that is so when I complain, the, the, this application, instead of going to the person who will be your boss or the person who will be your collaborator or the department which is running a project along the lines that you want to do research in, instead of going to, to anyone who is actually connected with what you will be doing, it goes to a committee somewhere whose task is to examine all such applications that a a given funding entity, usually a government entity, is going to fund. So the people there 
are not connected with the particular research. They are not familiar with the particular problem. Well, of course they aren't. In fundamental research, <laughs> you're more inventing new problems than you are in solving, or, or almost more anyway, than you are in solving them. And, and the, the group, the research group that is working on this knows about it. But the further away you get from that research group, the less the people know about it. And it's impossible for a committee to decide such an issue. So what they do is they fill out, they construct generic sort of questionnaire with ticks that have to be filled in, in boxes. And these questions in the questionnaire, because they are generic, they cannot possibly relate to any particular kind of research. So that means that the kind of research that is funded is research that can be justified by criteria that would have justified previous research, which is deemed to be successful. And that can only ever be incremental research because nobody can determine from such a criterion that a new field or a new sub-branch of a field is worth doing research in. And still less when it comes to the boxes that are about what the impact is going to be. You, you can't tell what the impact of, of research is going to be until you actually know what the result of your research is. Well, we were just talking earlier about constructor theory and the, and the theory of the universal constructor. And I was saying that I had certain questions I couldn't really answer until, until I know how the proof comes out. So those, those are some of the things that, that I think are, have gone terribly wrong and which were not nowhere near that wrong when I first entered the profession of physicist. How to fix them, I really don't know. I mean, I, I know what the state of affairs I'm looking for is, but I have deliberately steered away from from administration, but also in particular from understanding how the present administrative system works. I have a horror of it, in fact. So I don't know how to fix it. I just know the attributes that a working system would have. Fair enough. Well, David, I appreciate all of your insights with respect to the universal constructor and also the admittedly perhaps bleak state of affairs in certain aspects of academia, but fortunately all problems are soluble. So David, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I was about to say that. Yes, thank you. That was David Deutsch speaking with reporter Logan Chipkin as part of a series on irreversibility produced by Chiara Marletto. As I mentioned, I will be linking to previous editions on the topic of constructor theory and irreversibility, featuring Marletto and others, on the podcast page qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts. There, you will also find links to books for further reading by Deutsch and Marletto. And if you do purchase them through FQXI's bookshop, you'll have the pleasure of knowing that a small donation will be made to FQXI. Without your support, FQXI cannot fund foundational research, or indeed, fund this podcast. As always, you can find us all over social media, either search for FQXI or FQXI Physics, or contact us the old-fashioned way by email at podcast.fqxi.org. Or you could be really old school, I suppose, and send us a letter with an envelope and a stamp. Why not? But to do so, you'll have to visit fqxi.org to find out our mailing address. Thank you for listening. I've been Zia Morali. <laughs>